to uh, all welcome our filmmakers from the short film Keepers. And why don't you guys introduce, you, introduce yourself starting from the far end, please. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? I've been told you have to do close. Yes. My name is Chris Fitzsimmons, I'm the producer of the film, and yeah, that's there you go. about it for now. I'm Eli Cohen. I'm the script supervisor, co-producer. Yeah. Okay. And you're from Middlebury. And I'm from Middlebury. So <laughs> that's right. Where, where, where's, his, where, where's his proud father sitting in the back? Professor Rob Cohen. Here we go. Uh, my name is Paul. I directed it. With, and, and with great, great gusto, I might say. Thank you. I just would like to know, starting out, is keepers just the second word for finders keepers, in this case? I hadn't thought about it that way, uh, but it could be, yeah. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> First of all, I want to start with the score. The score is electrifying. I saw the composer's name up there. Yes. Remind me who that is and how was how did you work so? Uh, it, it's the the meshing of the uh, the editing, the, the sort of the I don't know uh, the tension of this created by the editing plus the score is tremendous for a 10, was a 10 minute film, 11 minutes? About, about nine minutes. Nine, nine minutes, ten. that is a power pack for nine minutes. So uh, how was working with the with the composer? Thank you for saying that. Yeah, we um, we met uh, Seth Glennie Smith is the, com is the composer and he, like everyone in this film, lent their valuable time um, and energies uh, to, to, to work with us. And uh, Seth is sort of a friend of our, of our DP. And that was kind of the nature of this whole project. Someone in the original kind of smaller group knew someone else who could do you know, sound mixing, Foley, whatever it was, it was all kind of an inside job. Um, and that was the only way we were gonna get this done because there was no money. So yeah, luckily they lent their time and, and, and massive talent, yeah, Seth Glennie Smith. And his father's actually, I think an Oscar winning composer as well. So it's kind of, Drifted, drifted to the sun and yeah. Wow. Absolutely. But you had no money. Surely no. there were five five hundred dollars floating around something. I, <laughs> did you wait? So you rented the boat? Uh, you got a favor to use that boat? I, I think it's it, we, we had we had some money. We just uh, have we're lucky enough this is our third film in the circuit and we're up against a lot of films that have about six times amount of money as we do, or three times, four times. We did for around ten K. Okay. Um, so it's not no money. We had to pay for gear. We had to pay for Captain Mike of Bad Dog uh, Boat, who, yes. was, uh, who ran our ship um, for us. So there were definitely costs. We paid our actor, SAG actor. Yeah. Um, he's from Boys in the Boats. Uh, oh, we put him on another boat. He was in the yeah. Clooney film, if you guys Boys in the have boat. seen that. Yeah. Now he was the guy in the boat. Um, yes. Uh, was it shot in one day? In order, three days. Okay. Did weather come into play at all? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so what about that? And also, give us a sense of sort of the, the mystery that's wrapped up in here. What are your intentions with the script? Was it executed the way you want? And in the end, the, sort of the obsessive nature of this comes through pretty clearly. But talk about the script, how you came to it, and executed this. You can come to the weather later, because that can be a, something that interferes with many, many films that are shot outside. But bring us from script to film. Uh, well, so, uh, Paul and myself had been working on something that dealt with you know, similar horror themes, but was a slightly different story. And you know, as is often the case with these things, the, the project changed over the course of its development. And you know, some of it was by choice, some of it was just by the circumstances we had. Um, and as we were doing this, our writer, Eric, kind of came up with this great idea. And you know, no dialogue, but it was just like, a bunch of incredible images and a bunch of incredible moments and so we kind of had to stitch those together and create something that was you know more of a fleshed out theme different from like what we originally had intended but i think that when we saw it on the screen for the first time we realized that we had hit everything that we had wanted to with it mm -hmm. okay those are gold bars that are going inside the cage is that right <laughs> Right. Yes, or we just left to sort of wonder about that. They are gold bars. Are gold I bars. see. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it, is his reaction like, oh my God, I'll be rich, and but but he still is there's like this total mystery. How, why is this happening? How is this happening? 
so much so that he has to immerse himself in the water to see if he can, you know, receive one himself. I mean, I'm trying to understand just, you know, sort of the themes that you're bringing out. I think the, the thing that we were interested in the most here is, you know, these the, the ideas of obsession, obsession and of, um, you know, we, we have this character who is, you know, in the, in the first scenes is kind of down on his luck and is running out of time and he gets something that he needs, but it becomes the source of where that comes from that drives it. Drives it. So it, it, you know, consistently wants more, but he doesn't want more for its own sake. He wants more for the answers to the questions. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, who has questions for these guys? Anybody? Anybody have an overall impression of the film? Yes, go ahead. So we knew that uh, doing any film on the water is a terrible, terrible idea. Uh, but we wanted to do it because we, a lot of parts of this film were like, what do we have access to? Like, you know, we don't have a lot of money, but what do we have access to that can sort of get us to the level that looks like we've had actual access? Um, so we knew we had a place to stay in Cape Cod, and we knew we had some kayaks, and we have, we have a production company, so we had some cameras. Um, so it was basically how can we shoot on the water and allow for the most flexibility if, um, uh, for lack of a better expression, if shit hits the fan, right? So if it gets, you know, it's really bad weather, how do we keep shooting? Because we have, we have four days. Everyone has jobs, everyone has a life. We have four days, we have to get this done. Um, so we shot with a very flexible camera package. We shot um, with a gimbal and a very small camera. Um, and we, for those exteriors, we didn't have another boat. <laughs> I wish I could show you guys some pictures. We took some pictures of uh, our two, we had two co-DPs who worked extremely well together and still do, um, luckily after this experience. Um, and we literally had these little tiny kayaks. I, I think kayak is probably a generous term. They're more, it was a boogie board. It was boogie board-ish kayak <laughs> yes. Um And I yes. wish I could show you these pictures because you know there's this moment where, okay, it's day one, we're, we work 4 a.m., we're up, we're, we're only shooting in natural light. We have no other lights so we have to, you know, we want to get sunrise and we want to get sunset. Um, so first thing in the morning, first day one, we hand the camera, we're shooting on a gimbal, small DSLR camera, we hand the camera over the side of the boat to our DP who is perched sort of with his legs in the water on this boogie board slash kayak. Um, I really oversold it when I said kayak. Um, and then the other D, our other DP is holding this thing and paddling out to get to the spot we need to go. And there are waves, and we're tracking great white sharks to make sure they're not around. Um, and it was uh, it was a thrilling experience, but I would not recommend it. Um, yeah, but so, no regrets. So your, your feature film, your next feature film when you make that will not include nautical elements. Well, we're trying to make this into a feature film. <laughs> you are. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, yes. And what about the underwater? Is that dronish? I mean, what is going on? You guys are having underwater shots, right? What's going on? Yeah. Well, uh, so kind of like what he said, one of the most interesting parts about this, given our time constraints and the ridiculous situations we had put ourselves in, was this need to just come up with solutions on the fly. I think they're like, as great as it is to see the movie on the screen, that is like the best part of filmmaking to me. And I think to us was just this idea of like, okay, a problem came up that we expected, a problem came up we didn't expect, and now we have 10 minutes to find a solution. So you know, we, have, we have multiple underwater locations, and one of them we thought would be deep enough to film the shots of him climbing the rope down. Yeah. And you know it was too light, it was too shallow, it didn't work. Too much sediment in the ocean. Yeah, it was too dirty. And this woman was just sitting in a beach chair on the shore, kind of watching us and laughing. And De Debbie, never Debbie, free. yeah, Debbie. <laughs> Debbie's the legend. And she uh, she asked what we were doing, and she politely informed us that twenty minutes away was a lake that they do scuba diving training in. And so we went there, it started to rain, it was about 60 degrees, we had our poor September, actor September, yeah. shivering inside a crate as we like hauled him in like he was a king and we were the, the slaves below him. <laughs> Just hauled him into the water and dropped him into the crate. And, uh, and we got the shots and they turned out the, like the exact color we wanted, the exact depth. We had our, our cameraman had to weight himself down with rocks because the 
wetsuits were too buoyant, so he, he took a tote bag, filled it with rocks, and sank himself down to the bottom <laughs> of the water. And we had about 30 seconds to get the shot, and we got the shot. Yeah. So that shot was not out uh, on the ocean. That shot was at a little lake nearby. Yeah. So clever. I'm liking it. The the shot though, where he gets in the Luke gets in the cage and yep. goes off. That's actually him. He does the whole stunt thing. And we had a big. So he he launched himself into the water. He launched yeah. himself, yeah. and the, it's ocean up to about your your waist. Okay. So it was about four four feet. Okay. And what you can't see, and don't tell. Well, the union knows, but. Um, <laughs> The, one half of the, the back of the cage is open to the water, so technically he he goes straight in, but he's able to swim out the back of the cage. And there was Eli was there on the side with an oxygen tank, and we had another guy there too. So and it wasn't super deep, um, so he sort of was able to. The best part about Luke is um, Luke Slattery, our actor, is that he was so gung ho to do this. Um, to get into a cage. His wife is still not forgiving me, but um, he was able, you know, he did this. How many times did he die? He wanted to do it. Again. He did it three or four times and he kept wanting to do it, so um, hats off to Water to temperature was what when he went in? 60? Atlantic Ocean in September, so you can not imagine. Warm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he wanted to do it three, t he did it three times and wanted to go back in. That's right. Obsession. Okay. Anybody else? Steve, go ahead. Um, I know you look for meaning sometimes, and maybe there's no meaning. But the first time he went in the water, he had goggles and his snorkel gear up. But when he went in the cage, he didn't. Was that intentional or continuity? Excellent continuity question. Right. So um, I think it was a bit of a sort of a sacrificial moment where it wasn't so much about having to know the answer, but to give himself to the answer. And in doing that, it was stripping off all the layers and offering him himself, naked. I, I thought it was more the, he was more obsessed the second time, or his obsession with wanting to find out. Right. And then he wasn't thinking of it. Just yeah. It just yeah, Frankie. Um, yeah. The tattoo on Luke's back, is that his own tattoo? Because I was thinking, are we supposed, is that supposed to be somebody recognized, somebody, whoever is down there, right. sees that as an identifying my favorite, my favorite thing about horror films is when you don't see the monster. Yeah. You know, I, I usually am really into the movie until the monster shows up, whatever it is. Yeah, the end of Rosemary's Baby. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, how long can you hold the tension until you actually have to reveal whatever the creepy thing under the bed is? So for us, it was kind of like a little wink, wink, like, here's the monster, but it's really just, on, it's a monster on his back, you know? Yeah. So, in, to answer your question, it is, it is a temporary tattoo. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, you were saying, oh, who, who else wants to jump? Okay. You were saying that you're going to make a feature of this, right? So, fill us in on where the backstory, if whatever you can, where the backstory is, and then if it ends at the same spot or if there is a, a, a large follow on to what we saw in the short. Have you fleshed it out that much? Let me just start with, uh, and correct me, gents, if you think this is wrong, but Keepers is more of a, um, an intro morsel for a world that is much larger, larger and expansive, and we hope that there are lots of people that want to make a larger story with us. We certainly have our version of that story, and that's what I think these two gentlemen are going to answer for your question, but it's, it's more up for interpretation. There's a lot of different ways that this can go, but currently we are thinking... Uh, yeah, so our idea is, and we, we had a great time uh, about two months ago, we all met up for a weekend in Charlottesville where our production company is based and fleshed this out, decided what we wanted to do with it, and so the idea would be that this is our jumping off point, and that the, no fe the feature would then... No pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And the, the feature would pick up where people are kind of having to deal with the fallout of this. The people closest to this character have to kind of figure out the mystery and figure out the meaning. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. So he is largely going to try and convince people that this actually happened to him. And then it goes on from there. But you're saying the five minutes short is the beginning of the feature. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of posing the question, what's down there? What is it? Why is it? Okay. Yeah, Jeff. So are you saying that once you do come into some money and you make the, the full movie, we're still not going to get to see the monster? <laughs> we really want to show the monster. Yeah. But 
hopefully the later. The monster's inside of you, Jeff. I know that. No one else knows that. <laughs> but my real question is, I I'm think, it, was there supposed to be any humor in this short? Interesting. Well, did you? were there moments that you thought were funny? Because truly, uh, I'm curious. I didn't laugh out loud because, yeah. you know, I had my phone off and I was taught. But yeah. I thought that it was humorous when you... Um, when he was, he kept adding things in the cage and then right. throwing it over. That was, to me, that was humorous. Right, yeah. But I didn't know if it was intended to be, if it was more like either, you know, quick, like, frustration, what do I do? And he's just, you know, throwing everything he can at it. No, I'm glad you thought there was some, some humor in there because sometimes I think it's a little bleak. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that you saw some humor. So it wasn't answer. intentional. No, it was not yeah. intentional. Oh, okay. But I do think in desperate situations, you're either going to laugh or cry. And so if it's something like that, I think the humor, it, that, that's, it makes sense that it comes out of that. It's a desperate act for him. And it's so absurd that this is what he's doing. Well, when you do finish this feature, please let us have an opportunity to consider it. So that you no, know, I don't. What's your time tail? Are you shooting it next year in 2025? Uh oh, that'd be lovely, though. <laughs> Get on your checkbooks. Wanna, anyone want to help us? No, no checkbooks. Fifty bucks will help them. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.